The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, what am I talking about? I'm quoting songs, a music, Psalm 19. We're going to be talking about that today in about three minutes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Jen. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Word of God. We're in the book of Psalms. This is really good today. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at this idea of kings being like shepherds. Ryan? Well, today my focus is also on Psalm 19, which gives us a beautiful presentation of both general and special revelation. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later. They're coming up at about 13 to 15 minutes, and Janice is coming up in about 17 minutes. Janice? Talking about trusting in God. All right. So all of this today, as we study the Bible, the Word of God, and we believe that God speaks to us. So take your Bible guide, turn to today's passage, Psalm 19, and let's read it and listen to what God says. Psalm 19, 1 through 11. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 11. You know, one of my favorite Psalms in the whole Bible uh, is 19, Psalm 19. It is amazing. It is wonderful. And I want to tell you that it was the Lord who instructed Abraham to look up at the stars and count them if he could, Genesis 15, 15 or 15, 5. Of course, we know that Abraham could not. None of us can. Yet in Psalm 147, verse 4, we learn that God can not only count the stars, but he knows them all by name. Really? Here's what it says. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them by name. Boy, isn't that interesting? Now, it's impossible for our creaturely minds to understand the vastness of God's intelligence. In fact, many people do not believe in the God, the God of the Bible, for that very reason. They simply cannot understand how God could have created the vast universe. It's a struggle for some to understand the concept of an all-knowing God also being a personal God. If he even exists, they ask, does God really listen? Does God really care? Psalm 19 is a beautiful piece of music given to the chief musician by David about the witness of creation and scripture. A song and a prayer to be learned by God's people. It begins like this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. In other words, the stars speak for themselves. It speaks of their creator. They speak of God Almighty. Really? 
Now, we've recently had some events which are interesting, and they mark some very fascinating ideas about God. Keep this in mind, that God is showing us things because he's perfectly timed it. If we believe in the God of the Bible, we believe that nothing happens by accident or mistake. Nothing. Not one thing. How is that possible, you ask? God is intimate, he is all-knowing, and he is almighty. I don't know how it's possible. Don't ask me, but I know the Bible says that, and it's true. So today, as we get ready to go to Psalm 19, this is the first, uh, or, or this psalm, and the first several verses of it, I just want to explain to you that it's important for us to realize that God is speaking to you and me today, right now. So Father, I pray that people would get the Bible guide if they don't have it, but I pray, Lord, that they would most importantly get your word, which is the most important word in the world. Help them to read and see the scriptures. Open our hearts to them. We want to hear what you say, not what everybody else thinks you say, uh, or not what I think you say. Lord, help us to hear by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look at the first couple of verses. This is really interesting because this song to the chief musician from David says this. The heavens declare the glory of God. This, these, these are not words written off the cuff. The heavens declare the glory of God. They declare it. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I need you to understand, God is for everyone, everywhere. God's message goes out day and night without ceasing for all of creation. I remember another gentleman, I had a lot of people talk to me over the years, thousands of people talked to me as we pastored, and he said, a younger man said, God, or Rod, why doesn't God just tell everybody on the news who he is? And I said to him, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. I mean, just look at the stars at night. Just look at the creation of God. Oh yeah, but Rob, we learned that come in by accident. And I said, well, that's what they told you. The stars were not created by accident. Genesis 3, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, it all tells us those were created for the signs and the seasons. Keep that in mind. God knows what he's doing. Let's go back to this because this is interesting. Here's what the Bible says. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. Now listen to that. It's rising from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Fascinating. God can be heard by anyone and everyone who wants to know him. Nothing is hidden from God. We need to come to him. There are no, absolutely no excuses. Beloved, God is night after night, day after day, God is speaking 24-7 all the time because night's somewhere. He's telling us, I am God and I created you. I created all this. This is what I'm saying. Now, we, we have excuses. and we Well, this happened, you know, 13 billion years ago. No, it didn't. It didn't. God's word tells the truth. God's word was here long before science. God's word is our understanding of what he did. And if we believe the Bible, we understand that God created that. God made that. That's important. Now let's read the last part of this. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Look at that line. That's important. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing 
the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now look at this now. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is a great reward. You know, this is beautiful music. God rewards those who try to keep his word. We should not only read the Bible, but we should obey the Bible in our lives every day and every way possible. God's Holy Spirit will help us, beloved. I mean, God, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, we pray, forgive me of my sin. And we say, Lord, come into my life and take it over. You know what God does? He takes his Holy Spirit and expands it into our heart and helps us to begin to transform our lives. Now, it doesn't happen, you know, all at once. We're, we're not, you know, made, we're made righteous, but we aren't righteous. But God slowly brings us, slowly brings us in. Beloved, we need to remember that. That's called salvation. Remember salvation today. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. All right, well, famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But God isn't the only one compared to a shepherd in the Bible, is he? It's a common motif that is attributed to kings in the ancient world. We see King David fulfilling that trope quite literally. He begins his life as a, a shepherd, his professional life as a shepherd, and then becomes a king. And there's allusions to shepherding throughout the accounts in the Bible of David's life. So let's take a more uh, close, uh, a closer look, I should say, at this shepherd king motif. Christianity has found a useful symbol in the image of the shepherd. Our word pastor is from the Latin meaning shepherd, and it's within the common language of the church to speak of this relationship between a pastor and his congregation as the relationship between a shepherd and his flock. Beyond this, the church as a whole recognizes the image of the good shepherd, that is, as Jesus Christ, as king of the church, its ultimate leader. This image of the Good Shepherd is taken right from the lips of Jesus himself, who in turn was quoting the Jewish prophets of the Old Testament, who in their turn were working off of a popular image in the ancient world. Nearly as far back as written history goes, there exists the motif of kings as shepherds. It was used in ancient Mesopotamia as far back as 3000 BC, the area of the world out of which Abraham was called. The Egyptian pharaohs used a shepherd's staff or crook as one of their royal symbols, and the prophets of Israel and Judah used the metaphor repeatedly. In the world of the ancient Near East, this was an obvious metaphor. The pastoral industry, the raising of sheep and goats, was a backbone of society. From these animals, the necessities of life were produced. Meat, milk and resulting dairy products, clothing from their wool and eventual leather, their horns were used as trumpets or containers to carry things like oil, and sheep were a means to barter or trade with. Sheep were even taken as taxes in organized society. For example, a hundred sheep a day were provided by the citizens of Israel for King Solomon's household and government. And sheep were a central sacrificial animal as outlined by the biblical Mosaic law. The image of kings and leaders as shepherds in the ancient Near East may also be seen with a bit of irony due to the sometimes stigmatized profession that it was. Shepherds were often viewed as uncivilized, always dwelling outside, away from cities, away from protection. They were necessary, but not glamorous. 
The symbol, however, likely derived from the special relationship that developed between sheep and their shepherd, including the sheep's ultimate trust of the shepherd and their obedience to his or her voice, sending a protective, nurturing message to help solidify a king's power. Biblically, the image of the good shepherd is taken on by Christ himself. Jesus is not only claiming to be the Messiah of Israel, but her true shepherd king as well. This goes a great way in explaining the early Christian artistic representations of Christ, not only as the good shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders, but also generally with a staff in his hands. This image would have evoked the metaphor of the good shepherd and likely doing double duty would have connected him as the bringer of the new covenant with the arbiter of the first covenant on Mount Sinai, the shepherd, Moses. So there we go. A ton more could be said about kings and imagery surrounding kings and how this, um, you know, is is used to understand God's role within ancient Israel. But we'll get there. There's there's more to come on this. Well, that's good because this is music and music uh, presents what God does in the cultures. And this crosses many different cultures. So that's good, Corey. Thank you very much. All right, Ryan, you're up. All right, well, Dad, like you, my focus is also on Psalm 19 today, which really does give a beautiful presentation of both general revelation as well as special revelation and how they're similar but also different. Now, revelation is just a fancy term for God's revealing of truth to us. But if you've never heard the terms general and special revelation before, then this segment should help. Check it out. Although Albert Einstein's theories of general and special relativity were very important developments in our understanding of how the universe operates, infinitely more important is God's unveiling of himself through both general and special revelation. That is, revelation through creation, as well as revelation through his word, the Bible. One of the places in scripture these two modes of revelation are beautifully displayed is in Psalm 19. In fact, in this psalm, there's a very clear division between verses 1 to 6 and verses 7 to 14, which are, by design, placed in juxtaposition in order to compare and contrast general and special revelation. It begins first with a presentation of general revelation, with those majestic and unforgettable words, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The second part begins with an equally memorable declaration regarding special revelation. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. According to this psalm, both modes of revelation are legitimate ways in which God reveals himself, and that is how they are similar. However, as their differences reveal, special revelation is clearly greater than general revelation. For one thing, while general revelation only provides general information about God, the special and written revelation of God's word gives us the specific information we need to know God. So general revelation might awe us with knowledge of God, but special revelation can transform us with the very nature of God. Also, because nature speaks no words, it is naturally subjective and must be interpreted. Though perhaps not evident at first, Psalm 19 verse 3 seems to especially attest to the silent witness of creation, and of the heavens specifically. Indeed, although the New King James Version says that there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, which makes it sound as though the heavens do have a voice, the italicized word where is not present in the original Hebrew. Though added for clarity, many translators believe this word shouldn't be there. Omitting where, as the New American Standard Bible does, gives a very different read. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. In other words, the testimony of the heavens is a silent, non-verbal witness. In contrast, the Bible gives us the very words of God, dynamically transforming words. Non-verbal communication can convey information, but it lacks precision and specificity, and thus it is very easily misunderstood. A third reason special revelation is greater than general revelation is that although the scriptures are perfect and pure, the current creation is imperfect and impure because it is under God's curse. Of course, even in its current state, creation remains a legitimate mode of revelation. However, it must be subject to and interpreted in light of the authoritative scriptures. As one scholar put it, the world of the Lord is imperfect in its bondage to the curse, thus condemning the souls of men. But the word of the Lord is perfect, converting their souls. What natural revelation only promises, written revelation accomplishes. Uh -huh. 
So it's important to understand that the general revelation of creation, while an important witness to the Creator, can never be a substitute for special revelation, and it should never be considered on the same level as the special revelation of the Scriptures. Because as I mentioned in the segment, general revelation is subjective, which means that different people will draw different conclusions. And the creation is also currently under the curse and as such is imperfect. It's broken. But the Word of God is perfect and pure. That's why this idea going around that nature should be considered the 67th book of the Bible is really dangerous. It ultimately puts man's subjective observations of nature on the same authoritative level as the objective Word of God. That is to say, it puts man's opinions at the same level as the facts given to us by God in His Word. This isn't right. Instead, creation should play a ministerial role while Scripture is kept in a magisterial role. The natural world must be viewed through the authoritative lens of the Bible. I guess the best way to say it, Ryan, is that the Bible is described as eternal, but nature is not. Yeah, that's a good. That's another way to put it. That's and true. so, but there are people who believe that you know nature is all about you know what God's about, but it's sin has wrecked it. Yeah, we, we, we are. We're living in a fallen creation. We right are. Now. It's imperfect. And so that's yeah. the reality of it. So it doesn't tell us the truth. But anyway, that's very good. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, and yet even still, so amazing. Yes. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. Amazing. Yes. absolutely. And, and, yes. and God has programmed in to mm -hmm. creation lessons for us to learn. Absolutely. Oh, 100%. Yeah. For sure. Okay, Janice. All right, so trusting in God was the title of my segment today, and I had written here to myself, commit all that we are and everything that we have to God on a daily basis. And in our reading today in Psalm 19, we ended with verse 11, but I want to read 12, 13, and 14, which is the last section of that psalm. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. And this is David talking with God. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Everything that we have, everything that we are when we commit our lives to Christ, um, we give to him. We give to him on a daily basis. And Rod, um, our reading was Psalm 19 to 25. And I touched on an, a little bit the other day about when you gave your life to Christ and how important the Psalms are to you personally. And your Psalm that really was pivotal or the Psalm that was very pivotal in your life was in this grouping between 19 and 25. I'm gonna give you the last three minutes and 30 seconds to share that. Psalm, one, psalm 21 is the psalm I got to. Uh, we were told that the discipleship class, uh, and I told my- And you were 14. I was 14, and my youth pastor said, well, don't worry about it, you can't take it. And I, he was egging me on, and I was very competitive. I said, what do you mean you can't take it with discipleship class? When is it? Saturday morning. Saturday morning, it's one day off school. Anyway, I went, and uh, he said, we're reading the Psalms. On day one, Psalm one, Proverb one, on day two, Psalm two, Proverbs two, on day three, Psalm three, Proverbs three, and the, and the rest of it. So um, we began to do that, and um, I got 21 days in. I got to Psalm 21, and I'll be honest with you, there was a hole in my soul. I mean, my dad was a pastor, my uncles were pastors. There was a hole in my soul. And I read the first two verses and I said, all right, I'm going to read the Psalms. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and your salvation, how, great, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire. You have not withheld his request on his lips. Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. God, I can't understand it. I don't understand. I am the pastor's son and I don't understand who you are. Who are you? And you know what God did? He answered me. The Holy Spirit descended and spoke to my heart. And over me, there was such emotion. And, and my whole spirit was healed. And I said, Father, I understand now. You're the Lord. I get it. Forgive me of my sin. I give you my life. I need you. I need you. I need you. 
Well, the Lord really, really touched me at that time. And there was a lot of things going on in my heart, but it was through reading the scripture, the book of Psalms, that that happened. And uh, I need to tell you that I went back to church. To get my, my whole life changed. And I went back to church because I was crying on the couch at that point. I was 14 years old. I went back to church. I was looking for Dave Yanatone. My, he's alive. He's in Florida right now. That was your youth pastor. My youth pastor. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, Dave, 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 where are you? Walked into the church. He was on the other side and he saw me. And he jumped over the pews. <laughs> he knew. Sunday morning, he knew. He saw me and he knew something happened. We embraced. And uh, yeah, that was really, really intense. I'll tell you, God answered the prayers because I had all these questions in my heart. As I read the scripture, I was reading this. I didn't understand it. Lord, I got to hear this. I, what were you? I don't even know who you are. And God answered every single question I have. Maybe, maybe you have some questions. The Lord will answer them. Pray to him. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I need these questions answered. Help me, Lord, today. Help me right now in Jesus' name. I do want to thank you and I want to pray for you if you've been a partner of this ministry or given to this ministry because these are very difficult times and we're watching uh, the Lord show us different things going on in the world and the times between good and evil are separating and they're easy to see. So Father, I pray today that you would help us to also follow you in everything we do with all of our mind, our soul and our strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, Amen.